In this video, we're starting a new project. It's a little electrical, a little mechanical. We'll be taking all these parts and designing it into one of these. In addition to that, we'll be giving away a license to Altium Designer, so stick around. All right, so what is this new project? You can probably see from behind, uh, it looks a little bit like Pong, a little bit like Breakout, a little bit like the simple CNC pendant. Um, it's all of those things and it's a mashup. So when I was in school, I remember a saying in from my art and design classes that was uh, creativity is the art of concealing your source. Sometimes I do a better job of it than others in terms of incorporating my influences. This particular uh, device and project is based on lots of things, uh, 8-bit, Pong arcade game from the days and the breakout arcade game and lots of work that others have done with microprocessors. Um, but for me, doing that full stack development is the fun part and doing it as good as I can given the tools and equipment that I have. Um, so that's always the best part is how can you reinvent something that's old to make it new again but feel like it's still retro. And so that's what we'll be doing in this project. We've got some aluminum CNC mill, we're 3D printing some parts, we're using some uh, some new uh, components that will give it a nice pixelated, uh, diffused look, um, as well as some neat uh, takes on the controllers and all that stuff. And so what do we have in front of me? These are all the parts that are going to go into it. Now it's taken about a week to kind of think through the design and the concept and how we can do it and make it original, but uh, respect the classic uh, influences that uh, make it such a fun uh, arcade game. All right, let's talk about the project. In this project, I uh, wanted to accomplish a desktop arcade project that's full stack. Obviously, there's ECAD, MCAD, and all that fun stuff. And for to accomplish that, I want to use an RGB matrix. Uh, the RGB matrix will be the heavily pixelated play field that will allow us to play Pong or Breakout uh, in either a one-player or two-player mode. And I plan on having a couple iterations on that. Um, so those details aren't finalized but in the last video of this three-part series um, we'll touch on you know the, the final gameplay um, but in order to accomplish that i wanted to use some rgb matrix uh, with that uh, we're going to need a, a processor i've decided to go with the 8266 espressive uh, microprocessor it's limited resource wise it's very cheap um, and Having the constrained resources just makes it a little bit more of a challenge to accomplish everything I want to do with this. Uh, in addition to that, we have some analog linear slide pots. Um, so for the controls and the paddles in this, I plan to use one of these slide pots. And so you'll, you'll have to move your paddle back and forth to hit the ball in that case. So those are some 10K slide pots. We also have some uh, analog multiplexers. Since there's only a single analog input on this, we'll use the multiplexer to switch around and read the different analog sliders that we have on there. We also have some digital inputs. We're going to use some small arcade 12 millimeter push buttons uh, for effect and uh, a barrel connector for the power supply, of course. In addition to that, we've got a piezo for some of that lo-fi sound of the beeping of the, the ball hitting the walls and whatnot. But Beyond uh, just the lo-fi approach, I'm also going to throw in a DF player, which is a MP3 player board uh, and a speaker to give some higher quality sound for events that occur within gameplay. So that's kind of cool. That'll offload some of the processing of that from the 8266 and the gaze will just be ran from interrupts. The RGB screen we will use fast LED and a few other libraries in the Arduino IDE. Um, so that's about it. I plan on using uh, aluminum for the body, 3D printing the base, and then for the acrylic, neat aspect of that is we're going to use this diffused black LED acrylic. Basically it's a diffuser layer that looks like a black acrylic. One side is polished and the other side is matte. And that will overlay on top of these. But in addition to the acrylic, we're going to use something like this that are 3D printed to segment all of the pixels so that we get clean, sharp pixels um, diffused through this acrylic. And so that'll give it a nice interface uh, and aesthetics wise, and it'll look really cool. Uh, we'll bring it all together. But before we do that, we got to jump over into Fusion 360, define some of the shapes for these guys and start doing our layout. So let's head over to the computer. All right, so over at the computer using Fusion 360, first I always go about uh, 
developing the components that will be used in the assembly. In this case, um, many of these parts were pulled off of GrabCAD, and I'll put links in the description for the relevant ones. Some were developed from scratch just to accommodate the spacing and design aspects of the, the project. This is obviously a five millimeter barrel connector for the power supply. This will have a five volt, three amp power supply coming into it. The LED panels that you can get off of Amazon, um, pretty straightforward, eight by eight. They have a pretty high pitch. I think there's about uh, six millimeters, no, about three millimeters between these, three or four millimeters. I could get those accurately. I think if, if you're interested, I believe it's 190 five millimeters across all three panels because I'm putting three of these panels side by side to make it an 8 by 24 pixel resolution. Not the greatest resolution, but to make it look great, we're going to diffuse it and pixelate it and heavily isolate these so that they're square and they, they don't look round because the actual image or the actual light on this is round and you know what they look like. They're just intense and super bright in your face. So we'll be diffusing that uh, and putting a matrix on top of it to clean it up and make it look soft and retro. In addition to that, we've got the ESP8266F. This is the 12F. Um, and while we're here, I mean, this is a pretty good model. I believe it was pulled off of GrabCAD. And this will be used to seat it on the, the uh, board itself. Now, the thing that's unique about this is that the circuit that you'll need to drive this is it's not as straightforward as if you've got like a node MCU board that has uh, USB and UART connectors and a reset uh, momentary switches and everything that you need to host this. So the circuit will need to incorporate aspects of that to host this, uh, this board, obviously to connect to the TX and RX. If you want to send data, you have to pull down a couple pins to determine where it boots from, whether it's uh, the file system or, uh, flash memory, um, and there's some complication. You need obviously pull down resistors. You can't leave things floating. Not that you would design it that way, but in case you've got lazy relying on these turnkey boards, this is not it. It's not exactly the easiest to host, but it has some great capabilities and low power modes, and that's why I chose to use it for this. I didn't choose it because it's a muscle car. I chose it because they're cheap, um, fun to work with, and sometimes it's fun to have a challenge that's a little bit re resource constrained. I think this is a, a dual core processor. Um, and as said, it has the Wi-Fi built in. So we'll probably set it up to do over the air updates so we can change the code over Wi-Fi and not have a problem. Should be fun. All right, in addition to that, we're gonna use the DF Player Mini. Now this is just a, a MP3 player, essentially. Um, you put all of your audio files on the micro SD card and then you can offload the responsibility of the playback and all that by using some triggers and you can determine when it's playing and basically offload the compute power of playing an mp3 file uh, directly to a speaker you don't need an amp or anything it'll handle up to a three watt speaker um, all through this little module nice little component easy to use they're cheap you can get them on uh, amazon of course uh, and so this will be part of the solution now this won't may, uh, be responsible for all of the gameplay sounds we need to do some more tests about how quickly it can do that the communication to this is uh, over a, a uart channel so it is uh, connect over txrx and then you send it commands to play files and advertisements and whatnot it also handles triggering and um, like i said earlier amplification of the audio signal to a speaker. 3.3 um, volts. That's all there is to that. Next, we're using these. I've bought about 20 of these um, some time ago. And so I try, try to always incorporate the stuff that I have into the projects that I have. These look nice. On the backside, I expect the base to be uh, out of black acrylic, so it'll look nice. and. Uh, elegant having these two on there. Now I'm going to use two of these for select and start as you typically would in a scenario where you need gameplay and you need uh, to be able to select some options for that gameplay. So my mindset is this is an old 8-bit retro arcade gaming sort of experience and so select and start like the old Atari 2600s is pretty much all you need to select the different modes of gameplay and to reset it. There won't be any elaborate uh, data entry or anything. 
we obviously need a speaker, so I modeled up this quick 25 millimeter metal. Uh, I think this is only 0.5 watt, but for the DF player, um, this will be the output for it, and it will be mounted in the base of the unit, um, which is on some silicone feet, so it'll be raised, and the sound will come out from underneath the device. That's the thought, at least. So um, first thing first, uh, the top portion of the arcade interface. I obviously wanted simple and elegant, less is more, so uh, trying to design around that. I like nice curves. This is a big block of aluminum. We'll see what we can do to uh, clean it up and present that RGB matrix in a way that looks retro, um, but also um, looks high tech, right? So I was playing around with uh, a few things here as I'm working through the design. This is just the top piece. I originally thought that, hey, maybe we can just do it out of this block of aluminum. Aluminum's um, pretty expensive these days, and so I didn't really want to um, buy a block of aluminum like this. This is about a foot wide and uh, three quarters of an inch or an inch thick. So it's a lot of money to mill into chips and eventually throw away, uh, especially since it's just a frame. So I had a piece of this on hand, and I'm going to end up using that. So what I've got here now to begin with is this top body now it's been milled out so much and I added an acrylic face there um, beneath you can see the circuit board area where the parts the components electrical components will be mounted but the the top body has really been milled all the way to make room for the matrix this grid that's going to diffuse those RGBs and the sliders so using the linear sliders as the human interface for you to control your paddle if you will um, is the is the idea here Considering how I'm going to mount this, I'm going to need to uh, screw this top into the bottom, and then the acrylic will be seated down into this socket here. Um, generally, I'll use like an O-ring, and we'll put a channel in there that will seat the acrylic in that socket nicely and very tight, and it won't come out. <clears throat> in terms of the top body, it's got some holes, and those holes will be extruded down through the circuit board and mount into the base, and we'll see how, how that comes together. Uh, similar to the simple CNC pendant, uh, this is a similar similar strategy. I really liked how that turned out. A lot of you like the concept as well. And it's really just an extrusion, and then uh, hit it with an angle, and then soften the edges so that it sits at a nice aesthetic angle for viewing and gameplay, like on your desktop. Um, so just to give it those clean lines and we run some chamfers on some of these edges and then with that I start to put the placements of the select and start buttons as well as the barrel connector on the back all right so while we've got the general placement for the buttons and the power supply it's still a little thick we'll come back to that in a minute but before we get too far along I lay out the uh, RGB pixel grid uh, just to see how that's going to work in there also can redisplay the uh, linear sliders there um, just to kind of give you an idea of the layout and gameplay there. Now to isolate these and make it heavily pixelated while we're using that diffused acrylic I'm also made this grid and that grid is going to really segment each of those RGBs so that there's no light bleed between the cells and what that will do is give us a, a good crisp pixel square. Um, they'll be chunky but it'll definitely be crisp. Next, I was mounting the speaker. And so if we hide the grid here and hide the matrix, and you see I laid that speaker in there to establish where it needs to go, and then defined the speaker hole. And I began to make a riser around this. This will be used to really just be a compression fit for the speaker. It's the exact size. We know that um, we'll always have some tolerance there. Uh, and if there isn't enough to hold it in place, then we'll use some hot melt glue just to quickly dab it into place. Uh, we finish off that riser. This base is all going to be 3D printed, so it'll, it'll be able to handle all these obscure shapes. Uh, the undercut um, of that angle really prevents me from milling it on any two axis CNC. So that uh, would be 
quite complicated to fixture and mount in this project. I don't know that it's really worth all of the material and time to do that. So in this case, we're just going to print 3D print the base out of acrylic resin. It'll have a nice finish and then we'll probably hit it with uh, Cerakote to give it the, that nice sort of gunmetal black look. Now you can see I've countersunk these holes in the areas around where the buttons go in and the barrel connector goes in there to give proper room for their nuts to be uh, attached in there and to basically fix them into place. Now you could just screw them into the material I suppose. Alright, with that I was uh, then making a default custom milled slider head, if you will, uh, and that is pretty standard. We might change that. I'm not sure what the final product's going to look like, but let's sort of bring back some of these parts and see what they look like. Bring up the board. The board has the sliders on there. We'll bring up the, the grid and the matrix, and then we also have a face that will be the black acrylic and then the body that surrounds it all. We've, all. we've also got nice chamfers on the acrylic, on the body face out of, out of milled aluminum, the base being black acrylic uh, with some clear feet on there and the speaker hole on the bottom. Now to finish it up let's kind of run forward Put a little graphics on there to simulate what the gameplay would look like and then the laser etched Pongcade logo at the top. That's pretty much what we're dealing with. Um, the design that I have in mind. You can see in this case there's two paddles and there's also two balls in play and the center section is like a breakout area that you don't compete against one another until you deplete that center section. So just an idea, we'll see how the gameplay works. That's the concept maybe as one of the modes of gameplay that I um, plan on implementing. And so we'll see what we can pull out of this 8266 and uh, what kind of performance we get. And I think this is a little ambitious, but I think we can make it look great and we can get some great functionality out of it in the end. So with that, We've got the board area, uh, we've got the sliders in place, and we've got the basic mechanical design of what the game device is going to look like. So we'll need to take that profile over into Altium Designer and design that schematic. Um, how we're going to host that 8266, how we're going to host the analog multiplexers, the DF player, all of that, those fun things, the pull up, down resistors, um, the voltage regulator for the ESP, uh, 8266 which all runs at 3.3 volts um, but the RGBs run at 5 volts so we'll need a voltage regulator and we'll have two different power for the devices uh, and so we'll just need to go over there and account for that so let's launch Altium Designer and start working through that design. Before we get too far electronic projects always start with good circuit designs and for that I rely on Altium Designer. From simple to complex if you haven't taken a chance to download a free copy and see what you're missing I've put links in the description, and with Altium Designer, creating these complex projects is a piece of cake. Through your development, you'll be empowered to do your best work as you grow into its more advanced capabilities. The link in the description below will allow you a free trial version of the software so that you can check it out and see what Enterprise Class ECAD feels like. Now back to the overview. Alright, so over in Altium Designer, I start a new project, add a schematic and a PCB, and we start working on the schematic. So the schematic that I came up with to use for this, uh, and granted, Typically, you would want to breadboard a lot of this stuff. Generally, I go by data sheets uh, to design the schematics, and then I'll get a spin a board. These days, boards are pretty relatively inexpensive to spin, um, and they give you a, a perfect breadboard to test on. Now, granted, this is based on a lot of experience, and while I'm not a pro, I'm confident in my ability to interpret uh, data sheets and specs and anticipate some of these things. Sometimes it most of the time it works. Occasionally you'll screw up, make a mistake, uh, and it costs you another 50 bucks to respin the board. But for today, uh, we'll walk through the schematic that we have here. Now, what I mentioned before, we've got that 3 amp 5 volt barrel plug-in that's coming in here. Uh, and from that 5 volt over on the right-hand side, there's a, a regulator that's going to 
bring that five volt in, convert it to 3.3 volts. And this is the quick and dirty solution. You know, a lot of people I've seen are actually running these on five volts. And while all of the components, um, the DF player and the uh, CD4051, which is the analog multiplexer, um, are all capable, and the RGB are all capable of running at five volts or like 3.3 volts to 20 volts. Um, the ESP12F is not. It's rated at 3.3 to 3.7, I believe, or 3.0 to 3.7. So it's really 3.3 plus or minus 10%. And so although I've heard of people running these uh, 8266 on 5 volt for multiple years, I think ult ultimately you'll have problems and you'll you'll fry the thing. Um, so for what it's worth, I did throw in this, this quick and dirty 3.3 regulator to drop the voltage and <clears throat> what I did there is basically everything in the circuit is capable of running at 3.3. I did some isolation, threw in a couple uh, capacitors uh, to eliminate some ripple there, uh, but everything's going to be running at 3.3 with the exception of the RGB, which is going to be getting that 5 volt straight from uh, the power supply. Now, um, now it's difficult to see all of the, the details around this. Um, in terms of the DF player, I surfaced a lot of these pins. I don't plan on using them, but there is uh, I did surface them to headers in terms of the I.O. keys or uh, advertisement keys. These are basically momentary switches that you can trigger uh, sounds to occur. Now, I don't plan on using them, but maybe in a future iteration, I might take advantage of those. So those are just surfaced to... Uh, pin headers. I also surface the speaker to a header. Obviously I'm going to use that for the sound, but I also surface the DAC, um, which allows you to run it into an amplifier. Now, I'm not sure what or why I would use that, but it's easier to have a header that you can leverage than to try to uh, patch into those pins after the board's already been spun. So that said, um, aside from <clears throat> the TX and RX, um, I just surfaced those extra pins from the DF player should I choose to use those. I didn't have an extra pin for the busy, but this, um, this pin will let you know if something's currently playing. Uh, it's a nice flag to incorporate into your microprocessor through GPIO if you want to um, you know, be graceful about when you play uh, audio files. In my case, I'll just make the best of it, and I probably won't be playing audio files at a rate that they would overlap anyway. So that said, um, let's dive over to the uh, 4051, which is an analog uh, multiplexer. It has eight channels, uh, eight analog out channels that you can switch between uh, by using this A, B, and C uh, binary flags. Those basically, um, you enable A, B, and C, and the combination is a binary value of zero to eight, and that determines which one of these analog inputs get sent to the output as a common output. And the common output gets sent over to the ADC pin on the ESP12F. So that's the only analog digital converter pin um, that can read an analog uh, sensor. In this case, the way I use the 4051 multiplexer is to run those slider values into the multiplexer. Uh, the ESP12F then toggles A, B, or C, depending on which one it wants to read, uh, and then it will read the corresponding common output from the ADC pin. So that's just going to be orchestrated through the logic in the Arduino sketch that's uploaded to this. And this allows me to multiplex, although I'm only using two. Um, these are stereo sliders, so I did bring in the left and right, and I may use them for different purposes, even though they should be inversely proportional to one another. Um, I might I brought those in so that I can uh, read up to four different channels, so two from the left slider and two from the right slider. Now that said, that um, is just a little complicated. We've got a, a, a voltage divider here because I, uh, the ADC pin only accepts one, 0 to 1 volt rather than 0 to 3.3, so this just steps it down to 1 volt so that the analog uh, multiplexer then passes a, a voltage of 0 to 1 volt and then we get the 0 to 1, 1024 10-bit uh, analog reading on the ESP12F. Makes sense? Piece of cake, right? 
All right. In addition to that, we did I did incorporate a momentary reset button, and then we also have a buzzer, which is a piezo on pin 14. Uh, in addition to that, the only uh, two other mandatory things that you need for this is to pull your uh, your enable pin high on the ESP12F, as well as pull uh, GPIO 2 and 0 and 15 low. Um, and that's required during boot so that you can um, boot from the flash memory as well as um, a, a few other necessary states um, to prevent the device from crashing when it powers up. So that said, um, that's about it. So, you know, this is kind of a quick and dirty project. So in order to push this all over to the PCB, I just used, uh, well, obviously you update the PCB document uh, and that creates a engineering change order. Uh, and then from that, it will generate all the components on your PCB. And uh, in this particular project, I just ran auto router all, you know, and then I checked, I ran a DRC. I auto routed everything. I put uh, a couple polygon floods pores on both uh, the top and bottom. The top is the ground plane. The bottom is a uh, positive 3.3. Let's switch over into 3D mode. We've got the two sliders here you can see and everything on the top side, the RGB panel is going to be laying in there on double-sided tape. These will be trimmed down a little bit, obviously. Uh, on the back side, um, it's where all the magic happens. We've got the 8266 in the middle, the DF player. We've got all our audio um, pinouts, um, the piezo pinout, the select and start button. And now I don't plan to use these headers. I'm just going to use uh, solder directly to board with the wires for those buttons. We've got the regulator, the power in, and uh, some capacitors there for the power. Um, and then we've got the WS2812B connector, which we'll use on the top side to connect to the matrix. I didn't inject for those 24 panels because I don't plan on using a lot of the pixels simultaneously. Um, there's probably at any given time maybe 100 pixels lit up, and I expect that to be fine um, with running through this single connector and not injecting it every board. If I need to, then I'll inject power over to the second and third boards um, from the from the same connector. With that, uh, this was exported over in um, by boo -boo -boo, export as step 3D. And then that file was brought into Fusion 360 to use for placement and arrangement in the mechanical um, environment. That said, with the board done, we uh, generated Gerber files. Gerber files were created and sent off to JLC PCB who's my favorite board house. And, and although they often pay for the boards, uh, this time I just uh, bought it out of pocket. While this board is pretty big at almost a foot wide, um, it was only $46 uh, for a dozen of them um, for three day processing. So not bad. If you need boards, um, I know a lot of people are looking at PCB way these days, but JSC PCB is reliable. I've got better board qualities from them the three through holes in alignment and their solder mask is always very accurate uh, really nice folks over there and they're always uh, helpful when uh, you know troubleshooting any issues that we do have so that said uh, we sent these boards off it's going to be another week in the next video we'll be uh, receiving those boards and assembling them this project was really about the design the ecad the mcad and the rest will come together in the subsequent two videos if you like Altium Designer and you're interested in a free license, well, today's your lucky day because I reached out to Altium. I said, hey, you guys sponsor the videos. Uh, we do a lot of ECAD, MCAD. Some of our viewers are really interested. I want to give away a free license. And they oblige. They're willing to give away a, a year license to Altium Designer. So if you're interested in that, we'll need to, to click the link in my description below. Go download a copy or your chance to enter in the drawing. And I'll be making the drawing in the next day. By the time this project is over, um, we'll have a winner and that will be announced in the final video. So if you want to be eligible for entry and possibly win that license, so download a copy of Altium Designer, leave a comment below for your entry into the contest, and we'll select one of you as the winner in the last video. All right, so that's pretty much the project in a nutshell. I kind of walked through all of the design elements, the MCAD, the ECAD, uh, to give you an idea of where I'm headed with this project. 
Now that those are uh, that information is sent off to JLC PCB to get those boards made, I'll begin fabricating the, the components for the body, the, the acrylic, the uh, 3D printed uh, diffuser and seg pixel segmenters, whatever you want to call it. Um, and in the next video, we'll be looking at all of those activities and what that looks like. Um, in the meantime, um, please participate in the Altium subscription giveaway. Uh, download a copy from the link in my description below. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel and share this with someone else. It helps grow the community. In the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too.